Hello, everyone. My name is Tian, a calm student here at Ohio University, and you are listening to my first ever podcast. As a young scholar, I am interested in academic work capabilities to create social changes. And on today's podcast, I have these two brilliant minds joining me to discuss their work and how they have been using storytelling to challenge dominant narratives. Thanks for joining me, Dr. Lynn Harder and Ms. Bacon Westervelt. So, Dr. Harder and Megan, storytelling is at the heart of what you have been doing. What attracts you both to storytelling? Thank you so much for having us today, of Tian. Of course. Oh, that is probably a question that I ask myself on a daily basis to remind myself of, of the millions of reasons that storytelling attracts me, has attracted me for over a decade, will continue to motivate what I do. I think that we as human beings share something very special in storytelling. We have a history. Our survival itself has been based upon storytelling from generation to generation. And I find that magical because we've learned so much through stories and we get to teach and empower and enact change. And there's endless possibilities with story. And so I enjoy helping stories kind of find life a little bit in ways that maybe someone hadn't envisioned before, especially those living their stories and, and wanting to share them. So I think that there are limitless possibilities that excite me within storytelling. And I think that it's one of the most powerful tools for change making both today and has been for all of human history. Thanks for sharing that. That really resonates with me because one of the reasons why I chose comms as my major was because I found that communication is a really powerful tool. And I have been listening to a lot of narratives back when I was in high school. And that really motivated me to be here today. So, Dr. Hodder, mm. how about you? What an honor to to be in this conversation with two people who I deeply respect. Megan, who's a creative partner and works at the Storytelling Institute uh, alongside our team, and you, Tian, a student who's joining us on that journey. So I'll start by saying what a privilege that we get to be here today co-creating a narrative that I hope will invite other people to contemplate how stories work in their own lives. Like you, Tian, When I was a child and in high school, stories were companions of mine. I think that one of the most important components of storytelling is their capacity to foster time travel, where you can move between the past and the present circumstances, and you can envision different future possibilities. And as a child who grew up in, in some circumstances that might be described as neglectful, I could go to the library and I could open up a book on a creaky old oak chair and be transported to a different time, to a different place, and I could catch a thread of that story. And I could identify with characters who were very different um, from the people in my lives. And that was really empowering. As I grew up, I realized the subversive capacity of storytelling where we could use stories to unsettle dominant narratives in our culture that sometimes we're unaware of and unaware of how they both enable and constrain how we interact with other people. And So if stories can be good companions and good friends that function as what Kenneth Burke would call equipment for living, they can also be friends that help us to envision a brighter future and a future that's more equitable and more just for all people. So 
I love their subversive capacity um, to challenge things that we take for granted. What you say reminded me when I was a little girl, I used to listen to my mom's bedtime stories and fairy tales, and they have really helped me to envision my life, to know what I can do, to learn the good qualities from them. And that's what I have had growing up with them. I have watched your most recent documentary, The Sourcing and Upcycling Local Resources. And I was impressed with how materials that were normally thought of as useless and meant to be discarded were recycled and made into these beautiful flower petals, puppets, fabrics, and so much more by Passionworks Studio. So for listeners who have not yet watched the documentary, I'm going to read the story behind it. Passionworks Studio is committed to locally sourcing and upcycling materials otherwise discarded. This story explores the studio artistic reimagining of post-consumer waste and industry byproducts in support of vibrant communities, workforce development, and a creative economy. Through a lens of abundance, we invite you to witness the potential that emerges when materials are transformed within and beyond the walls of the studio. Ultimately, this work speaks to a larger story of the beauty that can be found in people and places if our imagination is ignited by a sense of possibility. I would love to start with you first, Megan. So you were there, you were witnessing a part of the story, and you talked to people who directly experienced the whole process. Then you narrated the story through the documentary, and you shared it with the public audience through your digital documentary. So when you heard the behind story and hopefully relived a part of it just now, what stands out to you? That's a big, beautiful question also. (laughs) Thank you. First off, it has been so much fun to work with Dr. Harder on this, on this project and, and just find inspiration from the artists at the studio and Patty Mitchell, who has begun this journey years ago and keeps keeps it going so strongly and so it's been as Dr. Harder was saying such such an honor to be part of this I think to invite audiences into this space with us let me describe what I'm looking at right now I have brought with me today Owlet Owlet was a gift that continues to inspire me every day and it's it's a small puppet maybe a foot foot and a half high And it's a little owl, if you can guess that by its name, made of an upcycled prom dress of color purple with sequins and lace and wallpaper that's been painted and sewn on for the belly and some felt that's been shaped into the beak and pearls for eyes a little more felt around the eyes. And then these beautiful wings, again, of prom dress and felt sticking off the sides. And I could not find a more joyful addition to my life than this upcycled puppet. If we had not had the creativity of the artists at Passionworks Studio, these materials would likely have ended up at best, at a thrift store, maybe, right? An upcycling space like Makerspace in town. People coming in to use materials in different ways. But at its worst, potentially in a heap of trash somewhere, right? In a landfill. And now, thanks to the process and the creativity and the collaboration that is the studio, right? I have not only come to witness the story behind the documentary as you read it, but come to live it and appreciate it and, and, and yearn to have a piece of it with me. And so I think having served witness to the story, helping narrate it alongside Dr. Harder and now, you know, bringing it into my living and working space, right. It, it has, and will continue to, drive how I think and see the world and objects in the world and potential 
trash turned into something so much more. And so personally, it's impacted me, right? Very, very much so. And I also see it speaking to the potential in all of us, right? To see differently, to treat others differently, to treat things differently. And, and so that's really excited me as a storyteller, as a human being, right? As someone who cares about what happens to people on the planet. Um, so that's what speaks to me after kind of reliving, reliving the story that you just read. Thank you. Of course. So during my tutorial with Dr. Harder, we had the chance to learn about how objects can carry the stories along with them. And it's not just we look at them with a different eyes. We are creating a space for their story to be breathing. So Dr. Harder, what do you think about that? I'm reminded that we don't have to manufacture abundance in this world. It is all around us. It exists. We have to have an open heart and an open mind to recognize that abundance. And if you recognize it as something that has value and that has beauty, that's going to shift how you organize around it. And I am incredibly grateful for Passionworks Studio, for the, the founder and executive director, Patty Mitchell, for the staff artists, the core artists who bring this to life and live this out every day. And while this story that accompanies this podcast, listeners can click on the link and they, they can watch the story that you're referring to. We'll also include a link for Passionworks Studio so they can lean into this into the studio some more. While this is a story about Passionworks, it's a bigger story too. We can all learn in our daily lives, in our relationships, in for me as a teacher, how I walk into the classroom to look for the potential, to look for the abundance and create and hold space for, for people to amplify that, for people to realize the potentiality. You can you can start to see the sprouts, the the sprout of an idea, the sprout of a possibility of something that could be changing the way that we think. So to create an environment where that can take on a life and become beautiful, that's what this story is about. And that's what makes it the heart of the studio and movable to how we think about our relationships, how we think about ourselves as citizens of the world. I was moved by how passion works realize the potential within materials otherwise discarded. And I am sure that their projects must have taken weeks or months to be finished from the very first stage of sourcing which materials to use to the final stage of putting everything together. However, the whole process would turn into a short nine minute digital documentary. So can both of you share with us how you decided which details of their long story to be included in the final documentary? Um, I want to start with you first, Dr. Harder. You bet. So this is not an easy process to co-create a story and to steward it into being. And I, I kind of think of myself as a midwife of sorts. So when you think about midwives... They're not the ones that are having the baby, but they're there to support, right? The women who are bringing a child into the world. And so if we think about ourselves as stewarding, as helping to support people to narrate their world, that's an incredible responsibility. And in this case, I've been walking alongside the studio for 20 years and Megan's been walking with us for, for the past couple of years. That's decades of experience in the making. I think when it comes down to what to include in any given story, and in this case, a, a nine-minute digital story, the key is what is the most important idea that the studio would like to share with a broader audience? And so first and foremost, because of how we lean into our role as storytellers, we're always doing that with and alongside 
community partners. We don't view ourselves as owning those stories. We view ourselves as creating and holding space for them. So we take cues from them about what's most important. And as we develop action sequences, we're always in conversation with our partners, getting feedback. Does this seem reasonable? Is this ringing true to you? And because we have trusting relationships with our partners, they're willing to say, you know what? (laughs) I'm not sure I meant to say that during the interview. Can we rethink that? And so the story that you saw and that, that other listeners will see is different than than what we had originally envisioned. There are some action sequences that we thought were going to be a part of it. For example, we thought we would include filming a satellite dish that is the size of a barn that is now beautified through the studio. And in talking with the staff, they didn't think that was as important as maybe highlighting the the central product that is made out of upside, upcycled materials and that's their passion flower. So ultimately what's included comes through this dialogue and this real, I hope in our finest moments, an answerability to what is important for other people to share. And we enter into that process and think about how can we share that in a way that It is movable, that the lessons, the key takeaways, the equipment for living of that story, how do we do that in a way that other people can see, ah, this inspires me to ask a question in this context, in my life, in in a very different sphere of influence. And so those are some of the creative decisions that we get to make. And and that comes with a lot of responsibility. Definitely. Um, Megan, you are also the chef video producer for the Barbara Gerald's Institute for Storytelling and Social Impact. And I am sure that you, together with Dr. Harder and other partners, you have to decide on which details to include and which you may not be able to include in that. Um, is that a tough decision for you? That's actually, yes. And it's it's very fun. It is so much fun to figure out how the pieces best fit together to convey the message at the heart of the story, right? And and how do we engage and inspire audiences in a world where they are consuming dozens of stories of different links, but you know, everything from advertisements to documentaries on a daily basis. And so it is all about um Taking a step back, right? First looking through what material we have that speaks to the core story alongside uh, the the staff, the core artists, and Patty Mitchell. And, and trying to figure out what will be representative of a complete story without showing, right, A to B to C to D. How, how do you help the audience connect A to D? with just some visual cues, right, that we have along the way, and the, and the characters, how they're moving through the spaces that are so key to, to telling the story. So it takes a long time. They estimate, I think, for every finished minute of a digital story or documentary, you're genu- generally investing about 10 hours of work total from, from the creative processing of storyboarding, right, that, and then the, in the pre-production to filming, to looking through your material, editing, and and finally distributing. So just to give you a little idea, but it's really challenging. There's so many moments we want to include that at the end uh, will live forever in our hearts and hard drives, (laughs) but may not actually make it (laughs) to the final final story. And yeah, it's hard for someone who, you know, loves each of these characters and moments so much and we surrender and let go of some of them. Definitely. I used to do vlogs. Oh, yeah. gosh. So you know what I'm... Yeah. How yes. was that for you? Um, it was a fun process. But as you said, I have a lot of materials I want to include. But I can't because it would be too long for the audience. And I have to make very tough decisions. Um, so as a 
viewer of like the documentary, I appreciate all of your efforts into making the story coherent for the audience without left leaving out important details to like convey the whole story. I appreciate that. So you two were there, you two both witnessed, and you also listened to the Passion Word Studios journey. You also talked to a variety of people, from the founders to the artists and other guests coming into the studio. And then you told the story again through your documentary to share your understanding with the wider audience out there. I believe that a lot of beautiful, wonderful things have been shared with you too. But as we have discussed, not all of them were shown in the documentary. So how did you ensure that what you were trying to represent on the screen was consistent with the participant stories? Um, for this question, I would love to hear from your viewpoint first, Megan. Oh, thank you. I was I was going to hand it over to Dr. Harder first, um, but thank you. I, I think, again, it comes back to our principal characters voices and and in this particular video we had the opportunity to interview patty mitchell herself which was a huge honor and so inspirational i could just re-listen to her interviews all day <laughs> and so working alongside her as well showing different iterations of the video and parts of the video as we went uh, really helped us to kind of create those um, sort of limits of what what we want to include, right? What was representative what, of what she intended uh, to, to convey and, and maybe what was unnecessary for the story. I think that it's very key to work with those living their stories. I feel very honored and again, a very high heightened sense of responsibility when we're invited to do so it takes a lot to share your story right even even when it's it's a, a story that um maybe doesn't share as many vulnerabilities it's, it's celebrating something beautiful and creative and still right it, it's it's a story that they're living and and we get to help to to bring to life in a different way that that hasn't been and, and that's huge and so i think working alongside patty was first and foremost the most important part of this and then I believe also listening to what's happening around the space where we're filming at the same time to include the key moments, to include the key upcycled products at the end that will really excite people to think differently about possibilities. Right? There's so many products we could have focused on. And, and I know that Dr. Harder and Patty worked together to try to figure out which best would represent when we could have spent hours telling the story of each different type of, of um, product there. So I, yeah, it takes a village to create <laughs> a story, uh, especially in the digital realm. Yeah, I love that. I love that um, imagery, Megan, because it really is a community of heart workers coming together. At the Storytelling Institute, we imagine a world that is more joyous and more just through storytelling. And that just part is really important. I want us to anticipate unintended consequences of what we share, knowing that other people are going to enter in and make sense of that story, co-create meaning with us from their own standpoints. And so we want to try to anticipate that and do no harm. Mm. And of course, we no story is ever complete. They're always partial. It's a glimpse at one point in time. People are going to continue to, to shift and change. And we can make sure that what we share is responsible, reasonable, plausible, defensible. As part of doing that, I think it involves both perspective taking and perspective receiving. And so an example of how that happened in this particular documentary, initially, we had selected these vibrant images at the end that really pulled together people in community together in costumes that were made from upcycled materials. And one of the, one of the photos Patty sat with and, and 
it lingered with her and not in a good way. And so she's like, Lynn, I feel really uncomfortable with this. And and it was a photo that Megan and I thought were was really beautiful. It was somebody who had on a clown outfit that had been made out of paper mache and painted beautifully. And so I'm, I'm like, okay, talk to me about that. What's going on? And she said, I think it's that for people with developmental differences who compose the core group of artists for the studio, oftentimes they're kind of positioned as clowns. And when that happens, there can be unintended stigma and kind of making fun of people. And and so for her, when she saw that, that's what she thought about because she has this surplus of meaning, right? Stories always have surplus of meaning that we weren't thinking about, but she's lived, right? As somebody who has a brother who had a severe developmental difference, who has worked alongside these core artists, that was a part of of her social imaginary. And that made sense to us. And so that got cut. So I think it's a really thoughtful process that involves a village, like Megan said, involves the voices of of people because we're taking into consideration their perspective and we're receiving it and trying to understand it and respond to that, right? And so I think that collaborative, co-constructed, process is is one that we take seriously and it's a joyous one right because I think ultimately it's one that we all feel as good as we can as we share that story in the world and as you know Arthur Frank teaches us that stories breathe and they live and sometimes they're out of control and I don't want to live in a world where I control that so we do the best that we can as responsible stewards of stories and then we allow those stories to breathe Thank you, you guys, for sharing this. It's really beautiful. You have really helped me to understand that sometimes our view, our word view, our viewpoint may conflict with the participant's story. And we will do our best to respect their stories and help them to spread the narrative out there. So I think one of the reasons why the process of spreading the narrative is challenging one is because we have to really think about how we are helping them how we are going to convey this right and also what is the impact of the narrative we are going to share with the wider public out there at the heart of this digital documentary is how you are trying to convey the backstory and the studio's efforts in giving discarded materials a second chance to be turned into something beautiful and meaningful. But that isn't the only story. It's also about challenging other people's perception about the studio and people with disabilities. How, if at all, does your work help to challenge dominant narratives about the the studio and people with disabilities? Tian, I, I really appreciate that question because I was drawn to the studio two decades ago because of my ongoing curiosity about how we make meaning about bodies, about health, about wellness, illness, how that meaning making can help us flourish in the midst of inescapable uncertainty, hardship, suffering. For two thirds of my life, one or more of my family members have had severe disabilities. So as someone who I consider myself a disability activist in wanting to draw attention to creating spaces where all people can fit and where all people can bring their gifts and abilities and capacities and contribute right, to others and and to a greater humanity. And yet, oftentimes, to enter into a life and maybe alleviate pain or increase mobility. And those are things that I, I don't discount. And I'm incredibly grateful for science and technology and healthcare providers and, and that beautiful mix that comes together that can enhance quality of life. When a person's whole life, though, is seen from a deficit frame, 
then we might miss out on the abundance of that person, just like we might miss out on the abundance of of something that's going to end up in a landfill, that, that there's something there. We just need to look harder and we need to maybe see it differently. We need to rethink its purpose. And so while this story is about how the studio sees beauty in materials and that transfers to a broader life philosophy of seeing beauty in people and seeing possibility, I think at the same time, I hope it, it starts to unsettle just a little as part of many stories that are out there that are circulating. I hope it starts to unsettle a narrative that too easily focuses on all the ways that we don't measure up to a social sense of normalcy and unsettle environments that might make it difficult for some people to be fully present, right? Um, so when that happens, Rosemary Thomas Garland, a feminist geographer, she talks about how there's this misfitting. There's a misfit between a person, their body, their ability, their, their vision, and the built environments, the, the natural environments, the social environments. So harmonious fitting happens when we can cultivate environments in which people can thrive. And that's what's happening at the studio. So I, ho- I hope that our work can be part of unsettling the misfitting that happens and creating more harmonious fits for people of all abilities using all sorts of resources with an understanding that no person should be discarded and that resources ought not be discarded if we can envision otherwise and we can think about how that there's more life to be lived in some of those resources. That really makes me think a lot. What do you think about this, Megan? Well, I think that my perspective comes more into play in terms of um, visual language. That's generally what I speak most of the time. Uh, and, and, and having the opportunity to work alongside artists as we produced this film in the studio, right? And, and having the, having the chance to show what they would like, what, what they're doing, what they're creating, what they're most proud of their artwork that's been published on the covers of, of textbooks, right. And that's on exhibit in the gallery space in the studio and really listening to what, stories they want to share within this larger story of, of upcycling materials. I think that has been so inspirational for me again, and also right showing off unbelievable creativity that I, for one would not be capable of (laughs) my means. My, I've always been very much a photographer and videographer. I would not know what to do with a paintbrush. (laughs) And so it was so much fun to be taught as I was recording by these artists in the studio. And, you know, they'd show me how they they take maybe um, an image that inspired them in one way and they take a character and then they look at a, a landscape from something else and they're able to bring these ideas together. And that just blows me away because I, I don't have any of that ability. And I, I never once during that process not once did I think about their disability. It did not even occur to me because they're so talented. They're really talented artists. And so it was, it was a pleasure to work with them. And, and, and I think in doing so, I hope, right, that the larger impact is to inspire artists everywhere of, you know, any level, right, beginning, advanced, et cetera, just what's possible in a way that's equitable, right? Not not being ignorant to the fact that these are individuals living on a daily basis with different abilities than maybe some other folks. And, right, being very aware that we are celebrating artists at their pinnacle, right? For Well, we don't even know if that's their pinnacle yet, but they're able to share their artwork in a way 
that I think very other few other people have a chance to see the magic, right? The hard work behind the magic of the studio. And so that was, that was empowering to me. And, and I hope that that will be an impact for the audience as well. Thank you. Um, as I thought back to our conversation, um, you have become like the bridge between uh, the studio and the public as you help to convey their narrative. And I imagine that you must have had a lot of challenges during the process. So could you both share with me how do you struggle during the process when you know that there's a narrative that is bigger than the studio? It's so big. It is so big again. <laughs> And I'm only coming into this after you know, a few, a few years of working with Dr. Harder in the studio. And so it's very intimidating to try and do my part, little part in, in making some sense of this beautiful work and this very intricate, complicated story that's taken shape over decades. So for me as a, as a novice in this, it's, it's been a truly, it's been a learning, learning experience with Dr. Harder to, to understand how to even start wrapping my mind around this as a visual person and what part can I play in a very, very humble way in this huge narrative. And I'd like to very much hand it over to Dr. Harder because she's been in this so much longer <laughs> and helps me make sense of it. I think all artistic endeavors involve struggle as a writer When I bring words together, sometimes they dance a beautiful tango. And I, and I know in my gut that other people will be able to feel that and gain that rhythm. And other times it's really, really hard. And the more that you do this, the more that you stick with the struggle because you know it's in that struggle that there is aha moments and beautiful potential. And so I think that most things worth doing involve challenge and involve struggle and sticking with that and sticking through that and doing that with, with other like-minded people who are really committed to amplifying voices that sometimes have not been heard. It's not that those voices and those Um, possibilities haven't been present or spoken, but sometimes there's systems in place that might make it difficult to hear or witness. And so I think, I think sticking with the story through the struggle is incredibly important. I also think that as someone who engages in storytelling as part of my life muse, as part of my curiosity, I have to get comfortable with the fact that I'm never going to get it fully right. And that's okay. Because Tian, you could enter into a setting, the same one that I'm a part of, and talk to people and uh, listen to their stories over and over and see different patterned regularities because you're paying attention to something different. That doesn't necessarily make your story better Or, or not accurate, right? That does not deny the responsibility of responsible and reasonable storytelling. We can acknowledge the partiality of any story and also know that that needs to hang together and that some stories are going to be more believable and more compelling because of the work that we've done to ensure the multivocality Right? And to ensure that the testimony that is integrated meshes well with the background footage and the imagery that we're bringing together. And that the voices of the, the people coming together in that storyline make sense. All of that's incredibly important. And we will still never get a truth, right? Not the absolute truth. We can offer a reasonable, compelling, viable, important story. A challenge is being okay with that and, and knowing that people are going to continue to change, that story is going to continue to evolve, that meaning making is indeterminate. And for those reasons, some people are afraid 
to even enter into the process or to share a story. And I think you have to get comfortable with knowing that you can offer a very compelling partial portrait that transports people into a studio that will continue to shift. And it's, its meaning making is indeterminate. That's really wonderful and meaningful, I have to say. I've been sitting here listening to you both speechlessly. And so let's take a step back and look at things more broadly. What do you think is the role of storytelling in publicly engaged scholarship? I don't believe we can define it in a role, right? Yes. I think new roles are born out of the stories we share every day, new potentials. Right, that's that's sort of our running theme. I think this conversation is <clears throat> is limitless possibility, while also realizing that there's a lot of meaning in each of those possibilities. So I I feel that storytelling has the potential to climb mountains, right, to reach the bottom of the ocean, to take us places we've never even dreamt exist, and to help us see our own backyard in any way at the same time. Yes, definitely. Um, Dr. Harder, um, you have been a scholar in communication studies. Um, your work is not the type of original academic work that most people would think of when they think of a researcher, a scholar in the academic field. So from your viewpoint, Uh, How does storytelling play a role in publicly engaged scholarship? That's a a meaningful question. And I appreciate that narration of my work, Tian, um, because I I think I strive to be a boundary spanner where I live between worlds. And I think it's really easy in academic environments to stay in isolated silos where you're wrestling with these really chewy philosophical ideas that that are important and that live out practically in how we live. And I think the desk can be a dangerous place from which to watch the world. I find it more meaningful when I'm multilingual And I'm able to move between the cherished stories of a discipline, Foucauldian ideas of the panopticon and Burke's work on scapegoating and Goffman's social construction of stigma. All of those theoretical ideas are incredibly important. And they are lived and realized in the day-to-day actions of people as they live their lives. And if people trust us to walk alongside them and they share their experiences with us, then I think we are more fully able to realize the potential of theorizing. And that's when theorizing is incredibly, incredibly helpful. Theorizing in abstract ways using a vernacular or vocabulary that only a few people understand, that can distance people. So in a publicly engaged program of scholarship, the goal for me is to both contribute to ongoing theorizing about, for example, misfitting communicatively and materially, and at the same time, create opportunities for public audiences to think about how that work can allow them to ask questions about their own lives that they haven't thought about and maybe shares back with passion work something that offers them meaningful currency as they're trying to raise awareness about about their work and so what a beautiful job that i get to do that and and that i get to do it with um, students and with colleagues, a beautiful thing. I, I feel on my knees grateful for the blessed job that I have on a regular basis. If I might add to that, that's working alongside students through this process 
right? They're, they're, they're kind of that bridge between, you know, scholarship and the professional world where many may head after they, they graduate. And so having the opportunity to, to mentor, to learn from students through the process, there, there were students involved in the production of this documentary. There will be always students involved in, in the storytelling we do. And, and it's so much fun to watch them understand how meaningful, right, the, the bigger story is behind what we're creating with them at the same time that they're picking up on those, those shifts in dominant narrative that we're, going, that we're going for, that we're trying very hard to, to break things up a little bit, right, to be subversive in good ways. And, and, and I think that students have the opportunity in working with us to get in the field and do that, right, and and not just learn it through class classroom work. And, and I know there's many students in your class right now, Dr. Harder, who are learning through the process of some stories we've been telling with community partners. And so that's that's another beautiful way we've um, tried to invite more community into that publicly engaged scholarship work. And something I want to share with you, Tian, as as I. Um, we're wrapping this up. It's interesting, this space that you've created for Megan and I, that I did not anticipate feeling how I feel right now. Having somebody invite me to reflect on experiences that have been profoundly important. Usually we're the people who are creating space. And so I am so incredibly grateful for you in your generous listening and invitation to be a part of this. Thank you so much for your kind words, Dr. Harder. What I personally like about narrative is that I know that each of us, each person on this world has their own story and they have their own narratives. And we may, when we talk to them, we may see that, oh, these narratives are separating from each other. But when we step back and look at it, they are all fragments of a bigger story, a very meaningful one that we are co-creating them. And before we wrap up this podcast, there is one final question so I would really love to ask you both. So how has the work of using visual communication and storytelling um, transform you? Your questions get bigger and bigger, Tian. This is amazing. <laughs> and I did. I thank you for for giving uh, giving us an idea beforehand. It's it's that last comment you shared, though. I just that's going to sit with me forever. Thank you. We're all sharing fragments of a much bigger story. Thank you. Thank you very much. You are so wise beyond your years. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh would you like to begin this you one bet. Um, we are on this earth for what in some moments feels like a marathon and in other moments feels like a sprint and the symbolic resources in our surround are key to moving through that world in ways that allow us to experience joy and at the same time, transform structures and systems that might not equitably benefit all people. And this project in particular, and storytelling more generally, reminds me of the importance of narrative sense making and providing people with templates, with characters who are coming together in webs of relationships and those relationships shift across time as the process of plot connects events, right? And implies causation and suggests motive and all of those rhetorical capacities of storytelling, I find liberating. And I have to remind myself of some of the dangerous stories that I get caught up in. So minding the gap between the stories that I want to live and the stories that sometimes I succumb to, right? That that is um, has a, a beautiful benefit of of being a part of this work. I think the the work we do in general transforms me every day. 
I feel I get to reinvent the way I look at the world, the way I interact with my husband, my baby, my friends, my inspirations, my mentors through the work we do. It's hard to stay positive in this day and age often if one's staying informed about a lot of what's happening in other places around the world in our all the way to our own backyard. It, it can be overwhelming to try and see the good on the on the horizon. And doing the kind of work we do and, and telling the stories that are intended very much with all our hearts that as much as we can to create a more just and joyful world, right? It it reminds me that that we are making a difference, however so small or big, we hope. And that gives me great hope for what lies ahead tomorrow, 10 years from now. I recently became a mother and having the opportunity to create and share stories alongside those living such inspiring stories, to become a story crafter and putting these pieces together allows me to show my son at even his small age what we're all capable of as individuals, as teams, right? The, the mountains we can move when we're, we're a community of change makers. So that transforms me on a very theoretical level, high level thinking. And then every day to look at what's around me and the objects. And before I throw something in the trash, wonder, hmm, I know we can do something with that. I'm going to keep that around, right? What, what creative ideas might be spawned by, you know, these knickknacks and, and that's been just from this documentary alone, working on this, that's transformative. So I take something from every story I have the opportunity to tell and very grateful for, for that gift. That inspires me a lot. I used to come here trying to combine my interest in communication and film. And I was, I used to be told by someone that that doesn't sound really possible because I just don't know how to combine them. So when I learned about Dr. Harder and your work, um, I am really inspired by that. I feel like, oh, this is something that I would love to do in the future to help my narrative, to help spreading other people's narratives and really make some social impacts or changes to the community surrounding me. So thank you for joining me in today's podcast and it is a wonderful learning experience so for listeners who are listening to this podcast i will have the link to passion work studios video um megan's and daughter Hart's work and um you can have a better view of the story we are we have been talking about and mentioning um once again thank you dr harder and megan for joining me in this conversation i appreciate that and if I ever have a second podcast, I don't know, but I'm looking forward to that. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thanks Jan. You.